Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorf, a staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine. Hi, I'm Reniqua Allen. I'm a fellow at the New America Foundation. And uh, we're here today to talk about an op-ed that you wrote in the Washington Post about uh, America's conversation about race and President Obama's role in it. And you mentioned a bunch of recent racial controversies, uh, particularly uh, that kid who got shot uh, terribly in Florida and uh, hit, the police didn't immediately uh, arrest the, the man who shot him. And uh, that's been in the news of late. But, but your op-ed is uh, about a bigger subject than this, Dad. Why don't you just lay it out for us and, and kind of tell us what you wrote about and what your argument is. Right. So my, my piece in, in, in the Post on Sunday um, actually wasn't really, you know, it, it didn't start out with um, Trayvon Martin. And it started out for me on a more personal level um, on, in an incident that happened uh, with my, my friends a couple of uh, weeks ago. And uh, I realized that, you know, we have a really hard time talking about race in this country. Um, I have a hard time. I write about it as a journalist. Um, I study it as an academic. And I still have a tremendously hard time talking about race. Um, and, I kind of, and, kind of, and I thought about kind of the bigger issue. And uh, the president, I think, so eloquently laid out um, a really kind of great platform to talk about um, race in this country in the aftermath of the Jeremiah Wright scandal uh, four years ago. That anniversary kind of coincided with um, me writing this article and also, uh, you know, the, the happenings in, in Sanford. Um, so it was kind of this perfect storm, and I ended up writing about it. My main argument um, is that, you know, I'd like the president to do more, to talk about uh, these issues more, definitely not make it be his full-time job. I don't think it's his full-time job to talk about race. But I'd like to see President Obama grapple with it more. He's more than adequate. Um, he's, he's proven that he's more than adequately able to do so. Um, so I'd like to see a little bit more on his end. And, and also, I think it is also the responsibility of the broader American public to, to really talk about these issues more. I don't think this nation has had a really honest conversation on race in years. I'm a... I'm, I'm not exactly a millennial. Um, I'm somewhere between that, that, that weird age between Gen X and, and Gen Y. Um, and I think the way we encounter race is completely different than a lot of those in the civil rights generation, different than uh, Reverend Al Sharpton. You know, you, you hear about him a lot, um, and Jesse Jackson. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely time to change that conversation, and I think um, the president can help us do so. And I think, you know, we need to do it as well. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tired of hearing these stories of, you know, young black boys getting shot. It's happened since I, you know, the first time I could remember it. Um, I live in the New York City area. It was, a, you know, there was an incident uh, when I was like 10 or 11 years old, you know, right down the street from me. This kid got shot. I'm tired of it. I think we need to talk about it in really open and honest ways, not just for a minute or two while we're thinking about Trayvon. But we need to talk about it um, as a nation, you know. Right. For a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I enjoyed reading your op-ed. Um, what, what I agreed with you about is that it would be a good thing if if America talked uh, more about race or maybe talked better about race. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree that there's a need for, for an ongoing conversation, and I hope later on in, in this segment we can get into uh, what exactly that means, what, what kind of conversation you think th that we need to have and uh, and what kind of conversation I think that we need to have. But there was one thing that I disagreed with you about in the op-ed, and I, I put a piece up at The Atlantic, and we'll link both your piece and, and my Atlantic piece. And what I wrote was basically that I don't think that uh, President Obama is the right one to lead a conversation about race in America. I, I actually share your assessment of his speech in the aftermath of the uh, Jeremiah Wright controversy. I thought that uh, I, I was impressed by it, mm -hmm. and uh, I supported Obama in, in 2008, uh, largely for civil liberties reasons, not much to do with race, but, uh, but I thought it was a good speech. Uh, at, at the same time, it seems to me that the president of the United States, uh, whoever it is, inspires a lot of antagonism to whatever it is that he says based on the sort of reflex partisan culture uh, that we live in. And it, it just seems to me that 
the president actually is not in a very good position to uh, lead the country on in, in a conversation that would hopefully be nuanced and edifying. And, you know, on one hand, any president, Obama included, is going to have political imperatives that are going to constrain uh, what he's able to say. Uh, and it, he's also going to have a, a lot of people just reflexively reacting against whatever it is he says. He's going to have, you know, partisan opponents and ideological opponents trying to distort what he says, sometimes successfully. And uh, and so that's one of my objections. And, and I guess my other objection is that uh, we've heard a lot about Obama's experience with race and his upbringing and, uh, you know, his mixed race background and what his experience of America leads him to believe about both the promise of this country and the struggles. Uh, David Remnick wrote a, a great book that got into these issues with Obama and talked about how he had to construct his identity uh, all throughout his life and think really deeply about these issues. And I've been glad to hear Obama's perspective. But at the same time, I think that people in America experience race so very differently. And if it's going to be a useful conversation, uh, it almost has to be broad-based, and it almost has to be led by a lot of different kinds of people. And and while it's great to, it, it, I almost think that no one can lead the conversation. That it has to be a sort of bottom-up, uh, ev everybody talking about it and sharing their own experiences to be successful. And that as eloquent as Obama is, uh, he's still only one man and can still only share his experience. And as you mentioned, there are generational differences, uh, there are regional differences. I think. And, uh, and so I almost want to encourage uh, as many people as possible to lead the conversation rather than looking to a, a leader, looking to a president to, to kind of do it. I, you know, I, I, I understand, I definitely understand where you're coming from. Um, you know, and, you know, and I, and I appreciate those comments. Um, I think that, you know, I, I think that the way we talk about race, we do have, a multitude of different leaders, different interests, already talking about it, um, in 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 very very divergent ways and in smaller ways. Um, but we need someone to pull together the issue. Um, we need someone to to bring it to to have the gravitas that it needs to. I think it does need um, a a powerful leader. Um, and I do think that um, you know I I think that the president is able to do that, um, definitely, in a, in a, like I said, in a modified way. Um, I don't expect him, you know, I, I mentioned that, I don't expect him to be an Al Sharpton or a Jesse Jackson. He doesn't have to be a civil rights leader. Um, but because I think that that so many of our issues are not even just tied up to some of these, these cultural um, impediments that we have, um, some of these stereotypes, you know, the hoodie thing is everyone's talking about that now. But I think there's some real systematic problems, um, things that policies that we need to really look at and address um, and that I do think it's appropriate for government, you know, to be involved. Um, and so, and, and these systematic things. So Obama's background is a lawyer. He's a constitutional lawyer. Um, you know, I mean, he taught constitutional law. Um, I, I think those are right. some of the the things that he can help us. And, and I want to see it as a commander in chief, you know, uh, Bill Clinton had a, a commission on race. Um, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't expect him to devote all of his time doing it. Um, and I don't completely expect Obama as a quote unquote, um, you know, black man. I don't want that to be the only qualification for, for leading right, this yeah. conversation. Um, but what I think Obama gets and whether this is a product of his upbringing, um, his biracial heritage, Obama, I think, knows, I think he understands, and I, I think you mentioned this in your piece, I think he gets those nuances that are lost um, with a lot of the quote-unquote, you know, current leaders that talk about race. I think he's able to kind of move in and out those conversations um, in very interesting ways, very kind of progressive ways, I think ways that um, as a nation, I don't, I don't know if we're used to seeing that kind of, um, you know, those kind of conversations come from a, a black man, so to speak, or a, a black leader. Um, I think it's just kind of very new and interesting ways. Um, 
And I think in, in some ways, Obama speaks to this kind of millennial post-racial, you know, he, he, he clearly embraces his heritage, um, embraces, you know, his, his mother's side and his father's side. And, you know, he identifies himself as a, as, as a black man. Um, and he's, he's clearly very comfortable with that. Um, mm -hmm. But he also kind of shies away from it. And, and I want to see him grapple with that more. In the aftermath of the Henry Louis Gates uh, controversy, Obama made those, you know, remarks that everyone got so upset about. Um, and he kind of weighed in on the Gates issue. And I don't think Obama needs to weigh in to specific issues. But he talked about, again, he talked about the systematic um, problems with racial profiling. Um, and, and understanding that, I think, is important. That larger, the bigger picture, um, I think that Obama can can help us with and, and help us do it in a respectful manner. And I do agree, it's not just the voice of Obama. It's the voice of of all Americans. Obama definitely is just one person. Um, but what he is, is, you know, he's the president, so he can he can help bring a t intention to that um, issue. And I do think, though, I think you're right, it's a bunch of voices that are needed. It's, it's definitely not just one. Race is this incredibly complicated experience. Um, you know, even within the in the black community itself, Obama, you know, got a lot of black, especially initially. Is he too black? Is he not black enough? You know, his ancestors aren't um, slaves. You know, I mean, I think, you know, the black community is still grappling with it as well. Um, but but I think Obama, I think Obama's leadership and just to see a commentary at that level is I, I think is really helpful to the conversation. You know, one thing that's frustrated me uh, about Obama is uh, I, I do agree with you that his identity and the the thoughtfulness with which he speaks about it is uh, is unique in national life. Uh, there's certainly no one uh, that I can think of who has a similar experience that's nearly as prominent as Obama. Um, and, you know, I, I must say, I've been glad to hear him, uh, I've been glad to hear him get into that. It, it's a topic that, that interests me, even apart from politics, and uh, I think it interests you, too. And I think that maybe that's part of why we're uh, glad to hear Obama talk about it. But it seems to me that on the issues that, uh, you know, when it comes to public policy, when it comes to the things that I would want a, a politician to uh, uh, you know, or the head of the executive branch to talk about. Um, I don't know if this is part of what you're saying. I think about, I don't know if it's that he shied away from these issues. I just don't think his record is particularly good on these issues. Um, what I mean, you know, you know, one of the things that concerns me most in, in, in what I write about is civil liberties. And I think that, you know, there's just in San Diego, a case of a, uh, of an Iraqi immigrant woman who was beat to death and there was right. a note left next to her body uh, that, that was saying, you know, go back to your country, you terrorist, or something to that mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. um, and it, after 9-11, um, you saw an uptick in these sorts of hate crimes. And I, I think we, we also saw during the Bush administration uh, a, a pretty concerted campaign to, to, round up, uh, to round up Muslims and to round up Arabs and... Uh, President Bush, I think, was uh, sort of admirably stepped up and said, you know, we're not waging a war on a religion. We're uh, waging a war on terrorists. We're not, you know, we're not at war with Muslims. There are a lot of good patriotic Muslims. At the same time, his policy certainly rounded up a lot of innocent Muslims and threw them in prison for years on end. You know, a, a few of them are American citizens, uh, mostly from other countries. And... <sighs> Even now, during the Obama years, you know, you have this story that came up about President, uh, I'm sorry, about Mayor Bloomberg and uh, the, the NYPD going and spying on people, basically, uh, just mm -hmm. because they're, they were Muslim and, and going even into New Jersey, even into another ju jurisdiction is doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love to hear Obama uh, talk about those issues. I would love to hear him talk about the war on drugs and, and the disparate racial impact that there is in the criminal justice system. Um, I think like a lot of people, I wish that he had taken a different tact on immigration too. He, he's you know, had a, a basically a record number of 
uh, of deportations and or deportations and hasn't uh, hasn't hasn't really stepped up and and uh, proposed a solution uh, any sort of immigration reform. And not to say that I want him to do what Bush and McCain tried to do exactly, but um, I, I don't know. It seems like even though he has this. Uh, what you described, a very nuanced grasp of race in America, I think when it comes down to the policy level, I don't know that he uh, that, that he is on the right side of a lot of the what, what I think of as, as the most important issues. You know, I mean, you mentioned it early on in, in, in you know, kind of kind of listening to you. I think that Obama and I and I do agree that I think he's you know, I think it's frustrating for a lot of people, myself included. I think domestically on the policy level, I think, I, I, I think Obama has really been, I think he's been very cautious. Um, and I think that that does have a lot to do with uh, politically. I think, you know, I think politically he, he seems, and again, this is where I kind of feel like he's on the race issue and I, you know, and, and some other civil liberty issues as well. Um, you know, I, I, I think he feels like his hands are tied. I, I, I always feel like he's, he's very constrained. He doesn't want to go too far with a lot of these um, issues. Um, you know, you're looking at immigration. I mean, he doesn't want to. I, and I think, and I think maybe this is where you know somewhat of what we saw in the campaign. He doesn't want to seem, you know, like he's supporting. You know, he doesn't want to seem like he's. You know, I think he's very conscious. Let me start that again. I think he's very conscious of. You know, he's a Muslim. You know, that that's what the the, the conservative. Um, yeah, you know, so I think he's very conscious about that. I think he's very cautious because of that in many regards. Um, I think in terms of civil liberty, in terms of immigration, I think you know fundamentally, I think he is um, on the on the side you're articulating. You know, I think I think he is on the right side, um, but I don't think, in at least not in his first term, he's been willing to 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 go all the way on these issues, and I do think that's problematic. And um, my sense is that's because of the larger political implications. I mean, hopefully in the second term, you know, we'll see things turn around. But but I do think that he hasn't he hasn't put himself out there on, on a lot of those issues. Um, I do think he recognizes, you know, the political challenges if he does so. And and perhaps, you know, my 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 hope is that that's you know more of politicking. And I mean, of course, that's definitely a a, a bit problematic, but. Um, that you know, that's my sense on on these issues. That fundamentally, he is on the mm -hmm. right side of it, but um, there are some, you know, there are political, you know, he has, there's a political sensibility um, to him as well in the way that he's approaching some of these issues. Perhaps now that I think he's established himself in the foreign policy arena um, as being credible, I'm sure people will disagree, but um, I think he has established himself there. Um, I think now that that's done, maybe maybe we can take a, a step back. Hopefully, the economy is on its way, and, and look at some of these other things like civil liberties. But I do think, again, it, it, it's somewhat um, as being you know this African American as quote unquote having this questionable background. Obviously, I do not believe that, but um, but I do think you know the, the that's way. I think that weighs heavily um, in his mind, and also again going back to to Gates the way, um, you know, a couple months in the office and he, you know, he, 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 they were not happy at Obama and he's kind of never really spoken out again on a lot of those issues. Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, to start to change gears a little bit, one thing I wanted to ask you about, you wrote in your op-ed about, um, your frustration with the feeling of being quote, uh, the only one in various situations you mentioned, uh, I think the anecdote that you used was about being at a bar with uh, friends on the Lower East Side and feeling like everyone else in the room was uh, blonde-haired and blue-eyed. Uh, you mentioned some other context, too. Tell me a little bit of, about that, what, what you're trying to get across and what your frustration is. Right. So, you know, my frustration, um, I think, is is being in these, continuously, I think, being in these environments where, you know, we supposedly live in this, you know, great equal society in a place I think was really interesting for me because it's, it's New York City, you know, it's supposed to be one of the most diverse places in, you know, in, in the country, in the world. You know, you see this diversity everywhere and it, it's definitely there. It's in pockets and, you know, I think I'm, 
I increasingly am frustrated with how segregated um, my life and, and, you know, and I think the lives of, of many others um, continues to be. Um, and I think that's a very frustrating thing, whether it's, you know, at work or even socially. Um, it can be very frustrating how, you know, it's not legally, you know, there's segregation, you know, it's supposed to be gone, but, but we, we're still doing it. We're still living these highly segregated lives. There's a lot of in inequality um, out there, whether, you know, it's in terms of, like I said, employment, whether it's, you know, where, where, where we're living and how we interact with other people. And I think it's really troubling in, in the 21st century. Um, so that's kind of, and, and I realized that frustration was, was building um, that night. And I was there with, with some friends, you know, who I've been friends with for the last 20 years. We've been friends, you know, since, since high school um, and, and before that. Um, and, you know, it was really frustrating for me that I couldn't articulate how I felt around them. Um, and like I said, these are people that I would consider my, my best friends. Um, and it was frustrating for me to, to articulate it, to get across um, my experiences that I felt the way I feel sometimes marginalized um, in ways that I, I think that they don't. Um, so it was really frustrating for me and it was really challenging to try to get that across to them. And I don't necessarily think it, that it actually worked that night. And it made me realize how hard it is actually to, to talk about race um, at a time when, yeah. you know, when someone like Obama is president or Oprah is there or, you know, there are all these great signs of progress that we've had as a nation, and I don't want to take that away. But we also certainly have a lot of work to do. Um, and, and I think it's frustrating for me to get that out there. And, and, and it's frustrating um, to still live such, you know, to still have to choose, rather, um, you know, whether to have a, you know, an experience where it's a quote-unquote black night or, you know, um, yeah. You know, I, I don't necessarily think that that should be the case in the 21st century. It was frustrating for me. Um, and then it just, you know, it just got worse because they didn't understand. And, and, and that, I think, was a bigger issue, that it's a, it was a lack of understanding. Um, and I should say that, you know, it actually was a, a, it ended up being a really great moment because, you know, um, we didn't understand each other then. You know, we, we, we definitely didn't. Um, but it turned yeah. out to be really great because, like I said, these have been my friends for so long that, um, you know, we were willing to, and, and I have to say more on their part than, than mine initially, I was really hesitant to have um, these conversations. I didn't know how I was going to, you know, be able to articulate that, you know, I, I don't know, we have a black president. How do I talk about that, you know, America's still unfair and it's still hard being black. Um, but But in the end, it was really great because it, it opened doors and it opened, it helped our friendship and enabled us to, to be able to talk about race, I think, and to have a frank um, and honest yeah. discussion about it. And even if we didn't completely understand each other, um, you know, every second um, and every, every little nuance, um, we were kind of, I think, dedicated and committed to, to learning more about each other, to learning about the process instead of, instead of talking past each other, um, so that was that was also you know that that's also a big part um, of of you know what I kind of wanted to convey and might have gotten a bit lost, but that but that's what I wanted to convey um, that it you know I think it can be a learning experience on both ways because I think my fear is that you know it's it's not because Obama's black it's not because you know I'm 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 black I'm an African American um, that I can talk about race any easier um, you know I completely in that night in, in New York City didn't realize that you know. A lot of times it's really frustrating for, for, for white Americans, as my friend told me, you know, you don't want to be pegged as a racist every, every time that, you know, someone brings up a racial issue. And that's certainly not my right. intent. But, but I think it's, it's hard for either side to see the other side. And, and we do so often end up in, in shouting matches. And uh, there, there's a, there has to be a better way to go about it. Yeah, you know, I... Okay, so, so here, here are some thoughts about, about this issue of, mm -hmm. of, of being the only one. Because I think that when I was in high school, uh, in a place where, uh, you know, I grew up in Orange County, California, which is uh, relatively, 
relatively well. It's actually getting more diverse in that it has a lot of uh, Hispanic and Asian immigrants right. and uh, not, not very many uh, black people at all here. And the high school that I went to was a Catholic high school, and it probably skewed even a little bit wider than uh, Orange County itself. And it's not to say that there weren't any uh, people who weren't white at, at my high school, but I, I definitely, in hindsight, see that they were, uh, they might have seen themselves as, oh, I'm always the only one like me, you know, in, in this classroom or in this activity or whatever. And I wasn't conscious of race, uh, I don't think, back then. I mean, t back then, for me, race was something that my parents, you know, brought me up to be accepting of everyone and not to be racist. And uh, I, I didn't think much about it beyond that. I, I think if someone would have told me back then, I don't like being uh, the only one in these situations, that's uncomfortable. I might have reacted the way that your friends reacted on the Lower East Side. Um, for me, what changed my impression of that wasn't having conversations about race. It was uh, it, it was experiencing it. It was going abroad in college and living in a different country and uh, having the feeling of being the only American in a room and, uh, and what that felt like. It was, you know, going and being a reporter and covering stories in Harlem and going to a senior center where I was the only white person there and trying to interview people and remembering going to senior centers uh, where everyone was white and you know, just having it feel different, even though everyone was perfectly friendly and overall I felt comfortable. It was still a different feeling to be the only white person in the room and uh, it, it made me empathize more. Um, and I, I don't think that my experiences, uh, you know, mean that I know what it's like to be black in America, but, but I certainly know better what it is to be, to feel like you're the only one in, in a room, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, th I think that maybe... Um, more than conversation, uh, doing things like studying abroad or doing things like uh, seeking out uh, experiences where you're where you're the racial minority would go a lot farther for for white Americans to understand the kind of thing that, that you're talking about than hearing about it in the abstract. Because I think it's very um, it's very hard to, uh, to to listen to someone else's experience in the abstract and to and to sort of reason your way way through it. Um, it, it, and it's actually my, you know, as a journalist, as someone who uh, very much believes in the power of public discourse to matter, you know, it's one of the reasons why I chose this profession. Uh, I am invested in, in the public conversation and, and want it to be better. And I think, you know, op-eds like the one you wrote are really valuable. I think that conversation is really valuable. I want more of it. Um, I, I, I guess for that particular problem, uh, I think maybe... Uh, what's needed is going a little bit farther, or at least doing something a little bit different of, of challenging people to uh, get outside their comfort zones and, and try to empathize with different people who have different experiences. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I would, I would love that if, you know, I would love it if that happens. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, um, I'm a journalist as well. So, you know, like I think that ability to, you know, to go to different places definitely, informs us in a different way than it does um, the average person. Um, I would love it, you know, I would love it if, um, you know, my friend, and, and you know, that night I, I said, you know, when was the last time that you've been somewhere where there are only black people? Um, and, 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 I mean, you know, it doesn't, I don't think that, you know, it necessarily always has to be that extreme, but, um, you know, I do think, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, that experience, that experiences do help. Um, you know, of course, I got, I've been getting a lot of um, email and there have been a lot of comments. Yeah. Um, and, and that's actually the way a lot of particularly, you know, white Americans have said that they've ended up understanding what it's like to be kind of, um, and, and these, to kind of feel marginalized is to go somewhere, to go abroad. Um, and, and to experience it in, in different ways, and, and then they kind of, you know, understand it. Um, you know, whether that is actually a practical thing, uh, it's pretty much up for debate for me, you know, whether Americans will actually go out and, and do that or, you know, try to step out of their comfort zone a bit. But um, I certainly hope that, you know, I hope that that's a, a way to do so, and I hope, 
and I hope that, that we can do that and, and um, to foster that kind of dialogue, I think is, is really important. I mean, and it's not just about race, you know what I mean? It's about, it's also about ethnicity. It's um, the immigration, you know, de debate is a huge <laughs> showing, um, you know, why we need to, to deal with that. Um, it's about religion, you know, I think, you know, this, this whole question of Islam is still, you know, we have not worked through that, and that's another uncomfortable conversation. But kind of just like I think that um, the Occupy movement in the fall really helped us deal with class issues that we hadn't been able to talk about, um, I think that maybe we need to have some kind of similar conversation. I think, you know, money was hard, and I think it still is really hard for Americans to talk about. Um, but I think that, that the Occupy movement open that up a bit. And, I, and I'm hoping that we can have that kind of similar conversation. But race is so polarized. It's so hard to, to really even get to that level or even to get to the realization that you're doing anything wrong, whether you're white, black, um, Latino. Um, it, it's hard. And I think some of it is that self-realization. And um, you know, I, don't, I don't know how we get to it. You know, I would love for your idea to work. I, 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 I would hope that, you know, people would step out of their comfort zone, but it's hard. It's hard when you live in, you know, these, these segregated communities. It's hard when you, you don't have to think about, you know, race as much. Um, I, I think it's very hard and I think it can be very frustrating for, for a lot of Americans. Well, tell me a little bit more. We're talking in, in pretty vague terms about both of us wanting there to be a, a perhaps more robust conversation about race in America. What exactly do you think that the conversation needs to entail? What, what do people need to be saying, or, or what kind of issues do we need to be exploring? You know, what, what particularly do you want do you want it to look like? Right, um, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I would love a conversation. One, I think that um, I think we just need to kind of put it out there what the stereotypes are. We talk we talk in circles a lot about it. We allude to things. Um, I think the first obstacle we really need to grapple with is really coming to, to honest terms about some of these, you know, very, very prevalent held, whether they're right or wrong, I'm not even going to say misconceptions. Um, maybe there is a root in some of these things. I think we need to talk about that. Um, we need to talk about just what it means, why walking down the street is a black person you know, I, I would love, I would love it if, you know, it didn't mean anything, but why that reads different. Um, I think we really, we really need to start off there at this kind of very, very fundamental, at this very personal level. Um, it's some of these big issues that, that we need to work out as a society. And then, of course, that feeds into some of these discussions about the criminal justice system, about the education system, about the healthcare system. But we really need to get into some of the roots of these these questions of race, um, and of course, I mean, I, I can I can list um, you know the, the stereotypes that we have, um, you know, or the way that our society has been trained to think about race. But I think we really first need to challenge um, what these you know what what these stereotypes are and to look at it really closely and look at how how it. Um, how it impacts our own thought process. And I, I think we do, um, you know, really, really need to, to, to challenge ourselves, whether it's, like I said, whether it's a black person who sees another black person walking down the street in a hoodie, whether it's not just race anymore, maybe it's class dimensions as well. We haven't, you know, we haven't talked about kind of the intersection of race class and, um, of course, adding gender along to that. Um, and I think that's where a lot of these conversations need to start looking at how we deal with race in our own lives, um, in our in our very personal lives, um, and, and what that means. That means. You know, I, I don't know if you'll agree or, or disagree with this. My, my intuition is that there's a couple different ways that uh, would be the most useful uh, for Americans to have this conversation. Um, I think that if, if an individual is speaking, whether that person is white or black or Asian or Hispanic, I, I think that the useful way to talk about race, uh, or maybe the most useful way to talk about race is, 
you know, this is what I have experienced and this is how it makes me feel. And this is why I have the convictions about race that I do. So pe people explaining, uh, basically explaining their worldview and uh, doing so w w with the intention of just putting it out and implicitly saying, it's important for us to understand, uh, it's important to understand where we're all coming from, to understand where one another are coming from. And uh, and I think that there's a different kind of conversation that, that's useful to have, and that's this is this is how race is in America, not this is how I experience it, but this is how it is. And I think when you're making statements about this is how uh, it is, it, it, it's a lot more useful to do it uh, in as empirically minded a way as possible. Um, I, I think it's very easy to dismiss someone's anecdote uh, about how they feel as, well, you know, I, I grant that you feel that way, but you know, my experience is different. Or, uh, And I think that that's when things uh, like, um, you know, there's that, there was that study uh, about resumes. Uh, right. Oh, and, of course. Uh, yeah. My name is Renique. Quote. You know, I totally, yeah. Yeah, resumes being sent out with "quote unquote" white names and "quote unquote" black names, and, and how the uh, what people would think of as the black names got fewer uh, responses, even when um, they were equally qualified. Um, I, I think that studies like that uh, are really useful, and you know, I, I would I would think it was also useful if the study came down in the other direction. Um, I, I think that that sort of empirically minded stuff is just a lot more persuasive. Uh, to to someone, and I think there's value in both of these things. I think there's value in in trying to better understand uh, facts about race in America, and there's also value in understanding how people feel, uh, whether they're right or wrong, or whether it's ambiguous, or whether they're right or wrong. Um, I, I guess one of my intuitions about how the conversation about race goes wrong, uh, I, I think that... Uh, I think that by virtue of being white, by virtue of being the majority in America, um, I think white people aren't forced to think about race as much. And for that reason, I think that white people sometimes have a less nuanced understanding about race. Uh, at, at the same time, I, I think that the race conversation sometimes goes wrong when, uh, when people who feel like they've thought about race more, whether it be, uh, you know, white people who think that they've thought about it and want to, you know, advance the racial conversation or whether, whether it's uh, uh, black people or Hispanic people or whatever who, who want to tell white people how, uh, how, how they feel and, and uh, make them think about it more. I, I, I think that people naturally react against, uh, we need to have this conversation and I need to tell you, <laughs> I need to tell you the reality of things. Mm -hmm. I need to tell you how things really are. Uh, I think it's just human nature to sort of react against that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if I think you can have the same effect and, uh, and and really change the way people think by basically saying the same thing with a little tweak. When, when it's just not, I'm going to tell you how things are, but but I'm going to tell you how I experience things. Um, and I, I, when I say all this, I, I'm actually thinking not about any of the things that you allude to in your op-ed, but but I'm thinking about just. Uh, how how the racial conversation happened at the uh, at, at the college I attended and, and talking to friends of mine at the colleges a lot of them attended where um, there's this big imperative to uh, to turn out graduates who have a more sophisticated understanding of race and I think that that's a really important thing and, and, and a valuable mission um, I wish sometimes that it was uh, that it took place a little bit more in the classroom and a little bit more on the empirical side and a little bit less through residential life, not to say that they both don't have an important role to play. Um, but, uh, but I remember being, you know, an 18 year old thrust into an unfamiliar environment and, uh, and feeling as if I was, uh, feeling as if I was being propagandized, um, not, not. Uh, I, I don't even remember, you know, any particular statement that I might have reacted against. Um, but, but I definitely think that there is this feeling that uh, we're getting people who have, don't have a very nuanced understanding of race, and we're going to to educate them. And I think it's actually. I mean, in my case, it was certainly correct. I certainly had a lot to learn, and uh, and could have stood to use a lot more nuance. Um, I, 
I, I don't know that, uh, but I remember reacting against that feeling, and I think a lot of other people do too, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I want to go back, you, you mentioned, I mean, I think, I think you're right, using empirical evidence is, is, is helpful, but I remember, so that, that night in New York City, I, you know, I, I tried to kind of throw in some of the, that, you know, that evidence, and it was lost because of Obama. You know, it was lost because of this one very visible sign of progress. It doesn't, his name sounds like, you know, it sounded like the, one of the most wanted terrorists in the, in the world at that point. Um, so, you know, all the evidence kind of just, you know, in their mind, just kind of didn't matter anymore. Um, yeah. Because, you know, in o Obama is such a tremendous sign of achievement. It's like if this one guy can do it, then all of the research, it doesn't matter what the statistics have proven. He overcame, you can too. Um, right. And so I think that's, that's the challenge. Um, I am with you, though. Um, I'm saying that a lot, I realize. But, but you know, and, and I, do think it's a, so I do think it's a challenge. I'm with you, though, that I think, um, I think anecdotally it is a more traditional way that I myself as this kind of post-civil rights you know, person um, has grown up with, you know, you know, you know, sometimes I guess we have these diversity classes, like you mentioned, your college, um, you know, sometimes we have these classes on, on diversity. Certainly I've grown up in a multicultural world and had like the, the Black History Month thing. I grew up in, in New Jersey, so in the New York City area. Um, and, 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 you know, we've, we've definitely had more than our share of these, those type of events. Empirically, though, um, you're absolutely right that I think that I know I think in our schools um, it, we, we don't hear those statistics as much as we need to um, and, and we don't have an understanding of it and and that's where I would really like and that's where I was hoping to get an article that it's a systematic thing that I think that's that's also highly problematic and highly troubling um, you know there's just such a disproportionate of, of African Americans um, impoverished Latinos are included as well. Um, I mean, if you just look at the numbers, they're they're really frustrating. Um, such inequality is it's just so wide um, in terms of education and healthcare and in wealth. You know, the wealth gap is tremendous. Um, and, and and so some of these things um, are definitely you know in in the cultural realm. But but there's a lot of systematic problems that we need to address. We need to deal with it in the classrooms. So it's not just talking about, you know, it's it's not solely just talking about, you know, how do you talk to a person who doesn't look like you? Um, but but we're talking about how do we, we legislate for that and, and, and how do we deal with this politically? And, and I studied, you know, political science, and I don't frankly remember that many of those conversations. Um, so I do think it's I do think it's troubling, and I do think that that there's there are new ways that we need to talk about race in our society, um, and I think it's new. I think it's I think it's a challenge in the 21st century, and I don't I don't think we have that framework there yet. And I think that that's the interesting thing. You know, like I said, it's a lot of progress that's been made, um, it, which is great, um, and and we don't I don't think we we know how to put that all together yet. And, and those are the kind of conversations that we need to be having, um, figuring out how to put it together, how to put a framework together so that we can not only address these cultural things, but we need to talk to talk about these real systematic things that are, that are happening in our society continuously. Um, talking about our problems with the justice system is important um, to have, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, and I'm sorry, you, you cut out a little bit at, at the end there, so I didn't. I didn't hear the, the last words that you said, but but I, I was. I'm sorry. Um, is, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. There's something loud in the background. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, should I just wait? Oh, yeah. no, no, no worries, though. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, th I think I followed that, and um, you know, another 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 thing I wanted to ask you about. Mm -hmm. uh, this is I, th I think that there's a tension in the in the ongoing effort to uh, to talk about race and to, to grapple with with race in, in environments where uh, there is uh, there are different racial groups coming together, and I think the tension is between on the one hand um, 
on, on the one hand, sort of lamenting the the self segregation that happened mm -hmm. that, that you were talking about earlier. That you know, being out in the world and, and feeling like you have to choose whether you're going to be the only one uh, that, that isn't white in a group, or uh, you know, go into a, a group of black people and not have any white people there, not have any white people mm -hmm. that have made that choice to be the only one. Um, at, at the same time, uh, there's this imperative that you see, especially on college campuses, uh, to, to celebrate your own heritage, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and a greater, uh, I guess, a greater institutionalized mechanisms to do so. And so, so I think back to when I was a freshman in college, and there was at I went to Pomona College in uh, in Claremont, California. Mm -hmm. There was something called the Asian American Mentor Program. And it, it basically paired all freshmen into mentor groups uh, uh, with other Asian students. And there would be, you know, maybe 10 freshmen and then a sophomore who was kind of a mentor uh, to the whole group. And there would be meetings and activities uh, that, that they would do together. Um, and what, one thing I remember was that there were also what they called sponsor groups at Pomona, which were groups of about the same size, you know, 10 to 12 people. And it was basically the residence hall that you lived in, you know, on your floor, there would be 10 to 12 people that you would be in this group with, mm -hmm. and there would be a sophomore who would uh, sort of mentor you. And uh, w what happened during the first week of school is that, uh, you know, you were there for orientation and no one had any classes, and you would just be doing activities in your sponsor group, basically, with the other people in your hall. Um, and, and this was the same time that was set aside for the uh, Asian American Mentor Program to go and do... Uh, activities uh, with those mentor groups. So the effect was basically to pull out all of the Asian American freshmen and sort of segregate them from their halls. And, uh, and you know, of course, in the, first, uh, in the first week of college, you establish a lot of the patterns and make a lot of the relationships that, that end up enduring. You know, you get in the habit of, uh, you make your first friends, you uh, go to the dining halls together because you don't know anyone else and you all sit together. And uh, so you can see the uh, you can see the pros and cons of this, right? right? On the one hand, there would be Asian American students who would come and they would feel like, wow, uh, I'm a minority group on this uh, relatively white campus and uh, I feel uh, good about having people that uh, maybe understand some of the issues that I'm going through that are particular to that experience. And uh, I, I feel supported by this program, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, th there were other uh, people who were in the Asian American Mentor Program who kind of opted out right at the very beginning and thought, no, I don't really want to be, I don't really want to identify primarily by my race or I don't want to segregate myself in this way um, or, uh, you know, this just isn't for me. And those people sometimes had, you know, felt pressure from the people inside the group not to leave. Uh, so it's a very complicated thing. And it was an example of everyone, you know, being well-intentioned and trying to grapple with this difficult mm -hmm. issue. Um, and, and you can see the tension there. Uh, and I, I wonder uh, if you think that that tension is uh, an obstacle in, in society at large and how do we, uh, how do we grapple with that? What do we do about that? Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I do think that tension is there. I mean, I'm, uh, of course, I'm, I, I'm thinking about it on a personal level. Um, oh. I'm thinking, yeah. Hmm. Good question. Um, how do we, it is, it is, it is, I think it's a unique kind of problem of, of this generation. Um, you know, we kind of, I, in the nineties, there was this, this, this big push for multiculturalism. Um, uh -huh. but at the same time, there is this, you know, there, 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 there's a very, um, you're right, there's absolutely a very um, important strain of embracing your own identity, your ethnicity. And, and I do think you feel, you feel torn. Um, I know I am very conscious to say that I don't necessarily need to live in a post-racial world. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, and I think that, you know, that term is definitely problematic. Um, but it's it's more for me. It's more about understanding. I think it's a real struggle, though. I do. I think it's it's a real struggle that um, that a lot of us face because you know, and and you know, I just as much as you know, you're Italian or you're Irish. You want to be able to embrace that, 
while also, you know, embracing other cultures, embracing, you know, the fact that you're American or, or that you're from, you know, South America or you're from Europe or you're from Africa or, or whatever the case is. Um, I think it's a struggle. I do. And I don't, and I, and I don't, I, I'm not sure the answer. I don't have, I don't have a good answer for you. I think it's attention. Yeah. Um, you know, it's this, it's this thing that, um, oh uh, gosh, the, you know, W.B. Du Bois talked about, you know, the, this tension that, that black Americans have, you know, this two you know, that they have to constantly deal with being black and being American and trying to, to reconcile that, um, you know, I think it's, I think a lot of us, you know, now it's not just about black and white, but I think a lot of us are, are trying to, you know, still trying to come together. How, how do we deal with these different identities? And, and maybe now it's not just about being black in, in, in American, but also, you know, it comes down to sexuality and religion and all these other isms and things that we can add into it and gender um, that I think are important. And I do think, I do think it's a tension. And I think a lot of people are struggling with it. This woman, you know, you mentioned early, earlier, um, you know, the, the, the apparently it, it looks like a hate crime. Um, I don't have all the details, um, but, you know, but for being Muslim. Um, and I see a lot of, I, I did an article a while ago with, with young teenage, excuse me, young teenage girls. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a real problem for them trying to reconcile and, you know, their religion being this quote unquote other, um, but then also trying to embrace other cultures and, and, and not, you know, not feeling, you know, just about, you know, wanting to be their own, wanting to identify with whatever their ethnicity or their religion is, but also being embracing of an understanding of other people. And I do think, I don't think we, I don't think we've quite gotten there yet. We teen, we, we, we tend to just seem to yell at each other. We talk about differences. We clash and, uh, that, you know, and then, and then the conversation gets tense and, and we don't have these conversations at all. We just, you know, talk past each other and everyone's upset and annoyed and either, you know, we just don't talk about it again or either it comes out, you know, and we, we have this full on clash instead of really sitting down and, and kind of having these kind of more honest discussions and, and more open discussions. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, actually, you know, another obstacle and another tension to this happening, uh, as much as people typically think of the difficulty of, of conversations about race, uh, I, I think usually you think of the difficulty of talking to, to people uh, of a different race or talking to people with a, a different experiences than yours uh, as being the most difficult thing. Um, I, I actually, I don't know if that's always true. I think that, um, you, you know, you and I can talk about race despite uh, our different races and very different experiences, uh, partly because we have this common vocabulary and, and common culture that we share, which, which is to say, uh, you know, we're both reading uh, elite journalism. We've both been through academia and understand the vocabulary, and we both know uh, what we're talking about if we talk about creating a safe space or having a dialogue or... Um, you know, multiculturalism or these various sort of, you know, terms where the connotation uh, means a lot. And uh, I think in many ways it's easier for us to talk about race uh, than uh, for either of us to talk about someone who has had no exposure to uh, the uh, academic discourse about race or no exposure to this, to the, uh, I guess, I don't know, uh, mainstream media discourse about race. I, I think that uh, oftentimes when you hear someone who's saying the same things a, about race, in substance the same things, uh, but is using different vocabulary, it can be really grating to the ears of someone who has uh, been raised in a certain generation or to, to talk about it in, in a certain way and, and to be attuned to various sensitivities. Um, and I, I think that one reason why people are reluctant to talk about race uh, who may be uh, you know, di didn't attend a uh, college, maybe graduated from high school and went straight to work, or, or maybe, uh, it, you know, I think for a lot of Americans, this is an even more fraught topic because they feel like there's a way to talk about it that they don't entirely understand, and that if they slip up and say the wrong thing, uh, then it could cost them, you know, uh, it could cost them their job, or they could be looked at and thought of as, uh, as racist, or they could be thought of uh, as, you know, a quote unquote angry black man, or they could be thought of as, uh, you know, all, all of these different things that people worry about when they talk about this subject. And 
it's a tension that, that I think is very difficult because uh, there are good reasons for talking about race in a way that is sensitive. Uh, there's a good reason, you know, and I'm not talking about, of course, no, no one should use racial slurs. I'm not talking about that, but, but even beyond that, there, there's a reason for uh, talking about this issue with sensitivity and uh, with, with nuance and, and being aware of various pitfalls and stereotypes uh, that, that would grate on uh, other people's ears, sometimes for very good reason. Uh, but there's this tension here, right, because we want people to talk about race, and if we want them to talk about race, it's going to have to include people um, whose personality isn't sensitive or whose educational background means that they uh, don't have a nuanced understanding of the connotations of these different words. And I wonder what the way out of it is. And I confess that I have no idea what it is. Well, I, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think um, that, that people, you know, actually, I find that academics and um, you know, those are that would would be in the you know, in the media realm and in some of these you know, for lack of a better word, these these elite um, institutions. I feel like they are the ones that they're it's their attitudes and they're so skilled at the language that I think that that they often miss the entire heart of the conversation um, because they uh-huh. they know how to talk around it and. You know, um, <laughs> they, it's they, true, they, you know, they, they know how to talk around it and, and, and they get it. Um, and, 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 and they know how to distance themselves from it, I think, um, in, in hiding behind these terms. But, you know, if it's, um, you know, some, gosh, I don't, I don't want to fall into stereotypes, but, you know, if it's someone who like, like doesn't have a high school education, um, and wants to talk about it, you know, with his, all he knows is that his friend, you know, Bob and Malik, I, and I, don't mean to be using those words, those, those names, but just for simplicity's sake. Um, and he knows that, you know, Bob and Malik, they know they're different. They, they, they've been friends and, you know, they know they're different and they're able to talk about it and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and come to an understanding over it. And they're, they're able to do that over a bear. And, and, you know, I think, and I think what, you know, what we underestimate is people do have these conversations. Um, we underestimate rather. You know, they're, they're having these conversations. They're not having it at skilled levels. You know, they're saying, yes, I understand that, you know, walking around in a hoodie is, is scary. But, you know, if I, have a, if I have a shaved head, you know, people also look at me in different ways. Um, you know, that's, that, right. that's not necessarily like the highest level of conversation. It's, it's talking about something, you know, it, it, that can be as superfil- you know, super, superficial as, you know, just, you know, what the way it's very aesthetic. One's looking at one, you know, but, but I think it can also be be- very profound if, you know, Bob is talking about how, you know, his shaved head is problematic, too, or how, you know, which I didn't even realize until recently, um, looking at in, in, in Appalachia, the, you know, how clothing is important um, to them and how that, you know, they, they want, you know, the African-American to understand their struggles as well. Having these conversations about attire, clothing, you know, I shouldn't even have, you know, Trayvon Martin in this hoodie thing. You know, that's, that's not a, a, a huge commentary on, you know, you know, the, the aesthetic way that we, you know, the, that we look at how we present ourselves and, you know, whatever the, the academic jargon can be. But just talking about something as, as simplistic as a hoodie, a black hoodie, um, you know, I think that, that that speaks volumes to what we're talking about, um, you know. And even though people may not realize, you know, exactly what they're talking about on some academic level, I think that that gets to the heart of the you know, they get to the heart of a lot of these issues. Um, but there's still, but, but there's still some sense that we do need to find better ways to talk about it. We need to find better language to talk about race. Um, I mean, I like, you know, there's this, this idea of that one is a racist. Um, you know, I, I think that some of that just needs to go out the door. Like, you know, because I find that, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people in my experience as a journalist, talked a lot about race. Um, you know, there are very few people that I truly believe are, are truly racist. And um, now people mm-hmm. have prejudices, they have biases, but I, but I find that human beings are much more complicated, um, you know, than, than just being, it's being a racist. But I think that that terminology is so prevalent in our mind that we, that a lot of us can't get past that. We have these very oversimplistic terms to talk about race. Um, and I think though yeah. that's problematic, that kind of language. 
we need to work on rather than, you know, worrying about whether people have the exact, you know, kind of academic elite language, but we need to, we need to work on this kind of fundamental language, whether it's, you know, using a different phrasing or a different terminology. Um, we need to work on that at that level at this, I think it's a, you know, at this yeah, yeah, yeah. basic level. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you that the <laughs> that, that we do better to move away from the academic language, even even though I think that um, that uh, that's the I, I think that that is sort of thought of as the the way to talk about the way one should talk about race. I, I agree with you that uh, that that sometimes obscures the fact that it's just talking around race, and that um, and that we'd be better off. To move away from it, I think we'd also be better off. Uh, you know, Adam Sewer sometimes writes about how there's the need to be able to say, uh, you know, that statement is racist or that's offensive or whatever, without uh, w without saying you're a racist right. or without impugning or, or without or without you know sending the person into the abyss of being shunned by polite society. You know, right. um, and, and, and I think that that's true too. Um, we're we're at about. Uh, we're about an hour. We're a little bit flexible on how long okay. we can go, but is there anything else before we are done that you wanted mm -hmm. to add that you didn't get a chance to say? No, I mean, I was just thinking about, I, I was thinking about that kind of, that strain of thought you were talking about. You know, where I find it's really telling, I've, I've talked to, I, I, I try to broaden my horizons in, in talking about this subject. And I, you know, I talked to a bunch of teenage girls um, a couple of years ago about race. And I mean, I think that the, the really looking towards, and it, it was, you know, it was this roundtable conversation, very simplistic conversation. Um, but, you know, it was very telling. I think there's an honesty among among youth. Um, and, and, you know, definitely, you know, they don't understand everything, but they understand a lot more than, than, than we think sometimes. And um, I think, you know, it's really about engaging everyone in on this conversation. Um and, and like I said, it's including those at the highest levels of government. And Obama himself said it, you know, it's, it's about these conversations that are having, that we're having around, you know, around the water cooler um, that, that we really, really need to help, you know, help. I think, you know, first challenge ourselves in the way we think about things, um, look at broader society, you know, and then look at these really systematic things that are happening that I think are in, important. But I think that, um, you know, in, the, in these conversations, I do, I think what I'm interested in and what I was hoping Obama could do um, was to look at alternative ways to talk about race so that we don't feel like we have to talk about race in the ways that Jesse Jackson and Reverend Sharpton do. Um, you know, the, right. the Dave Chappelle show was, 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 was pretty funny, and I thought it did it in a good way. And there, there's some new shows that, that do it. I love South Park a lot. Um, which I think, you know, is, is really brilliant in the way they talk about a lot of issues. Um, and, and I think we need to find these kind of non-traditional ways also um, in that we can, we can really enhance the dialogue. Um, it's so complicated. It's so muddy. But, you know, it doesn't have to be this, like, serious thing that we always, you know, that, that one person's a racist and, and one person's not. Um, you know, we can find interesting ways to, to talk about it, to advance the dialogue in new ways. And, and that's what I'm hoping to do. And, you know, like, even if people disagree with me, I think it's great that we can even have the conversation these, you know, these days. Um, and just, you know, if you're willing to talk about it, just willing to open yourself up and at least try to understand, you don't have to understand everything. I think that, I think that it's, it, it's really important. And, and I wish that, and I guess this is the heart of the argument, you know, I wish that Obama clearly has his own, you know, he's, he's, I think he's still working some things out. He still has had his own experience with identity. We, you know, he, he wrote about it. Um, he very, very rarely talks about it, but I, I think we'd like to see it. It's, it's a messy subject, you know, and, um, and, and America's had this quote unquote messy relationship with it. And I think seeing more, not less of that, um, it is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I guess I, I will make my closing pitch. I, I, I wonder how it would work out if there were a uh, It Gets Better style YouTube uh, YouTube campaign. And by It Gets Better style, I just mean a bunch of people uploading to YouTube uh, videos of themselves talking and just sharing their own mm -hmm. experiences of race in America. A bunch of different uh, people all talking about it in their own way. Um, 
I would certainly be very curious to see what people said, because despite paying a lot of attention to this issue, I feel like I uh, have a window into only a, a, only a few different kinds of people right. uh, who tend to talk about this sort of thing in, uh, in the national media. And, you know, so, so I see that and I see the people that I know personally in my own life, um, but that's far from a, a, a big swath of America. So I would, I would be really curious to see uh, if, if a bunch of different people uh, were to do that, what they would say. Uh, and, and I hope, uh, I hope I will see more from you uh, on this in the future. I will look out for your byline and uh, I hope we can talk again sometime. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I hope so as well. This is a great beginning. Okay. Well, thanks so much.